Good afternoon and welcome to this, the June 26th edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. My name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy and I am happy to be with you today. Um, there's a lot going on, so I want to go ahead and get through um, all of the introductory things so that we can go straight to the questions that concern the community most. So I want to tell you a bit about the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. Uh, we were founded in 2021 with an ambitious vision for all college and career school students in the state of Maryland, and that's that they would have the opportunity to achieve these six pillars of collegiate financial wellness. Those are being credit worthy, ready, resilient, empowered, successful, and thriving. If you'd like to learn more about the mission and the vision of the center, you can visit us at mccfw.org. And if you are um, inclined to provide financial support, we are a tax exempt nonprofit organization. You can make your donations online too. And there's the link mccfw.org slash support. All right. So before I get into updates and questions from the community, I just have to issue a quick disclaimer that the information that's presented during office hours is for informational purposes only. We do our best to provide you with the most up-to-date information possible, but this landscape is changing constantly. <laughs> and so we have to make sure that um, we put it out there that you should of course consider information from reliable sources like the center, but also, um, your personal portfolio of loans, your household circumstances, and use all of that information combined to make a strategic decision that makes the most sense for you and yours. So the information presented today does not constitute personalized legal or financial advice. All right, now that that's out of the way, um, I wanna talk about some updates. So um, I'll start with the IDR adjustment first, because the IDR adjustment is something that's been going on for a couple of years now. And the IDR adjustment um, has a deadline to get the greatest benefit that's coming up on June the 30th. So um, I've done a couple of media appearances talking about the IDR adjustment just ahead of this deadline, but just wanted to reiterate that the deadline is June the 30th. So that means that um, if you have loans that are not included in the IDR adjustment currently, you would need to apply to consolidate them at studentaid.gov, and you would need to complete the application to consolidate by June 30th. And again, that application is online only at studentaid.gov. If you have direct loans, those are already going to be included in the adjustment. If you have federally held loans, those will be included in the adjustment as well but there's some people who have commercially held loans and those loans will not be included in the IDR adjustment unless they are consolidated into the direct loan program. And we've got several videos out there um, explaining to people how to determine if your loans are direct or federally held versus commercially held. Um, I think that might come up in the questions a little bit later on, but you wanna make sure that your loans are on track to benefit from this adjustment by June the 30th, because the most generous benefits of the adjustment are set to expire. So the place to go is studentaid.gov, log in, take a look at your loans. If you see Department of Ed in front of the name of your servicer, that means that your loans will be included in the adjustment. If you do not see Department of Ed in front of the name of your servicer, um, then you would need to consolidate those loans to make sure that they're getting the greatest benefit from the IDR adjustment. And again, um, the consolidation, the choice of whether to consolidate depends on your loan types and what your goals are for repayment. But what we're seeing right now is for the majority of people, consolidating those commercially held loans into the direct loan program makes sense because it will give them the opportunity to get the most credit possible toward cancellation by way of income driven repayment. So IDR adjustment deadline is still coming on June 30th. That's four days from now. Now, the other thing um, that has come back into the news is SAVE. SAVE stands for saving on a valuable education and SAVE is the newest repayment plan offered by um, the federal government for federal student loan borrowers. SAVE was implemented initially in July of 2023, but it was rolled out in parts. So uh, the first part that was implemented in July 2023 helped some people see their payments reduced because SAVE actually protects more of your income from being considered as available 
to go toward your monthly student loan payment. So some people saw their payments decrease already once SAVE was implemented last summer. SAVE also has stopped um, borrowers from being held responsible for excess accrued interest. So if your payments were not large enough to cover the interest that was accruing each month under normal circumstances, you would just see your balance continue to rise. But for people who enrolled in SAVE, the government was actually picking up that excess interest. So people were making their payments on SAVE and not seeing their balances grow, even if their payments weren't large enough to cover the accrued interest each month. Now, the second part of SAVE that was supposed to be implemented next week included a provision that would have reduced payments for people who borrowed undergraduate loans. Right now, SAVE takes 10% of what's called your disposable income and looks at that as available to pay your student loans. As of July 1st, that 10% was supposed to be cut down to 5%. And um, again, that was only for undergraduate loans. So if you had undergrad loans, your payment might've been cut in half. For some people, they were expecting to see their payments drop to zero. If you have a mix of undergraduate and graduate loans, at least the portion of your loans that was based on your undergraduate debt could have seen um, you know, a decrease. So um, basically what people were expecting was a reduction in their payments if they had undergraduate loans. But earlier this week, there were a couple of court rulings that have been issued that are, um, at least for now, temporarily preventing any further provisions of SAVE from going into effect. So for those of you that are enrolled in SAVE and you're worried about what's going to happen next, the benefits that you already have through SAVE, we're not expecting those benefits to go away because of this. However, the benefits from SAVE that we were expecting to see implemented next week, as far as we know, are not happening. So if you were expecting to see your payment decrease again next month, as of right now, we're not expecting to see uh, that happen because of these court rulings. So um, hang in there. Stay tuned to office hours, of course, because as this situation evolves, which it will because if there's litigation involved, we will keep you posted. Um, and also, please know that there are going to be a lot of people that are creating um, content about this because it is um, considered you know, somewhat breaking news. It's affecting millions of people. And you have to be very careful about the kind of information that you take in. Um, some of the information might be framed in a way that um, causes more panic than relevant information. So the best thing that you can do is just um, stay tuned to reliable sources. That would be the Department of Education. I also consider the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness as a reliable source. But in terms of your day to day life and whether or not you need to pay your student loan bill, that's something that is reserved for your loan servicer. So if you have a statement that says that, you know, your payment is X dollars and it's due in July, you need to follow the advice of the servicer and pay your bill as um, promised. This is not a situation where, you know, hearing about this court ruling should um, cause you to, to be in immediate distress. I know that the news is unfortunate and it is contradictory to everything that you have heard that you should expect from SAVE for basically the past 12 months. And again, that's very unfortunate. But what I really do not want for um, anyone is to hear this information and to panic and let that affect the way that you show up financially, but also in every other area of your life, because wellness is what's most important to us here. So um, stay tuned for details. The situation is evolving and just make sure that you keep on going about your business the way that you normally would, which is paying your bill. Hopefully you're able to pay it on time um, according to the information that's provided by your servicer. Um, as far as events are concerned, we had another visit to Eleanor Roosevelt High School earlier this month. Um, we have our annual symposium coming up on July 23rd. That event is free and open to all. And we're going to have a lot of content talking about financial wellness in the state of Maryland. But much of that content is also applicable to other schools and um, you know, borrowers and students and professionals across the nation. All right. So with all of that being said, I think it's safe to get into uh, the first question from our community. 
So the first question has to do with FELP loans. It says, I have three FELP loans with zero qualifying payments and six loans with 119 payments with my 120th payment due in July. Should I consolidate before the June 30th deadline? This is a great question. And um, it also speaks to the importance of knowing your loan types because the benefits that you're able to uh, receive are dependent upon the types of loans you have. So let's go to the answer. All right, so I'm sorry, I spoke through that part already about save. So let's go into the, uh, the answer for the question. And the question um, was about consolidation, whether to consolidate the FELP loans um, to take advantage of this IDR adjustment. So um, when it comes to FELP loans, there are a couple of reasons to consolidate them. The first one is for people who are interested in public service loan forgiveness. And that's where this question was going. If you want public service loan forgiveness to cover all of your loans, then all of your loans need to be direct. So this person mentioned right away that they have FELP loans. FELP loans do not qualify for PSLF. So to get those loans on track for PSLF, you would need to complete the application to consolidate at studentaid.gov. Now for people who are not pursuing public service loan forgiveness, but are interested in getting credit toward cancellation through income-driven repayment, if you have federally held FELP loans, then you do not need to consolidate because those loans will be included in the IDR adjustment. However, if you have commercially held FELP loans, those loans have to be consolidated in order to get them on track for the IDR adjustment. A quick thing I wanted to note was that outside of this, um, this IDR adjustment period, there is no situation in which you would get credit for repayment history on a commercially held FELP loan. After consolidation, the clock basically resets to zero and your first payment would mark number one on the way to a 20 or 25 year repayment journey. But if you have FELP loans, that means the loans are at least 12 or maybe 13 years old at a minimum. So that means you have plenty of history that we want you to get credit for when it comes to cancellation. This adjustment would allow you to consolidate your FELP loans and gain credit for the history attached to those loans. And that's something um, that only came about because of this IDR adjustment period that is set to expire. I mean, at least the greatest benefits of it are set to expire on June 30th. So for this borrower, if you want those FELP loans to be brought into consideration for PSLF, then you would need to complete the application to consolidate at studentaid.gov by June 30th. Again, that application is online at studentaid.gov only. And if you want all of your loans to be considered for PSLF, they all need to be direct. So anything that's not direct, whether it is a commercially held FELP loan or a federally held FELP loan, Perkins loan, anything else, if the loan is not direct, it does not qualify for PSLF. Thankfully, you can consolidate it during this IDR adjustment period to get credit for that repayment history and get on track toward PSLF. So make sure that you go to studentaid.gov to complete that application to consolidate by June 30th. All right, let's take a look at the next question. Okay, uh, the question has to do with public service loan forgiveness. It is, who do I contact since I am still seeing zero PSLF qualifying payments after consolidation? This is a popular question and it has been for years <laughs> because when you consolidate your loans, your older loans are being paid off and a new loan is being originated. The way that that new consolidation loan is viewed initially is as if it has no history whatsoever. So when you get your first payment count after consolidating, you're going to see that you uh, might have zero qualifying payments or maybe one or two. That's because the first look at the loans, or at least up until this point, the first look at the loans only considers the history of that new consolidation loan. And since it's brand new, it has little to no history. So as for who you should contact, let's go to the answer. So as for who you should contact, um, you should contact 
no one in this case. And pardon me for the, the brief flub there. I was looking at the screen <laughs> and trying to read, but it wasn't there. But the answer is that you should save your time and your energy. Um, the reason is that this is a normal part of the process. The consolidation loan is looked at as brand new. So um, if you call, you're probably going to be on hold for a while only to be told what I'm telling you now, which is that this is the natural part of the process. And within a few months, you should expect to see an update. The other thing that's happening in the background here is that um, the month of May began a processing pause for PSLF applications. So if you submitted an application in May or June, the application might have been received. However, the application is not being reviewed because of that processing pause that's happening right now. We're expecting um, that that pause is going to run into July, perhaps. We don't have an exact date on when that pause is going to end. So the timeline is subject to change. But there are a couple of things at play here. There's a consolidation, which causes that um, repayment clock to temporarily reset to zero. And there's also the PSLF processing pause, which means that no matter how far along you are in the journey, um, when you submit a PSLF application during May or June of this year, you're not going to see any changes made to your qualifying payment counts until the pause is over. So our recommendation here is for you to be patient, Rest assured, you have done your part. If you submitted that PSLF um, application for all of your employers, then you have done your part. And now it's up to you just to wait uh, for the system to do what it does and for your qualifying payment count to be recognized. All right, let's move on to question number three. All right, that question also has to do with PSLF. Question is, I start my new job on July 1st. Can I still apply for PSLF now, even though it is before my start date? When I try to fill out the form online, it doesn't allow me to enter a start date past today's date. So this is a great question. First and foremost, congratulations on the new job. I'm wishing you the best. Um, but with PSLF, PSLF, um, as far as the application is concerned, it's backward looking. So you cannot apply uh, for to, you cannot apply for employment that has not started yet. So because the date of employment beginning isn't until next week, you would not be able to complete the application for PSLF until next week. So the advice here is to um, fill out that application for PSLF at studentaid.gov slash PSLF once you have officially started your job. I can appreciate why uh, this person wanted to complete the application before June 30th, because June 30th, again, is that deadline to get the greatest benefit out of the IDR adjustment. Um, but in this situation, because the employment is not starting until after June 30th, the application will not be able to be submitted until after the employment begins. So July 1st would be the first date that this person could start to earn credit toward public service loan forgiveness, and also the first date that this person would be able to complete the application online. So PSLF, um, like I said before, you can not apply for future employment. It's based on the now. All right, let's move on to the next question. That is another PSLF question, surprise, surprise. It's um, I'm in the middle of getting my master's degree while working full time for a qualified PSLF employer. Can I consolidate before June 30th and um, those will be at 80 payments as well for PSLF. So it looks like there are two sets of loans at play here while the person is in graduate school uh, working and pursuing a degree. So let's take a look at the background. This per person is currently enrolled part time in a master's program and they are working full time at the same time. Um, their undergraduate loans are from 10 years ago. And right now they have a PSLF qualifying payment count of 80. So given that background, let's take a look at the answer. And with most of these questions, and this is going to sound very familiar, it depends. It depends on the types of loans that this uh, person has taken out during graduate school. So when it comes to um, consolidation, loans cannot be in an in-school status um, and be consolidated. Uh, they have to be in repayment or in a grace period. Um, something 
other than in school in order for the consolidation to be approved. So if the person is in grad school, sounds like they have new loans. Um, the options that are available to them from the federal government are direct unsubsidized loans or graduate plus loans. The typical advice is to take the direct unsubsidized loans first because they have lower interest rates um, and lower origination fees. But when it comes to PSLF, they have less flexibility while in school for people who already have credit toward PSLF on undergraduate loans. The direct unsubsidized loans have a mandatory in-school status. This means that as long as you're enrolled at least half time, those loans will be in an in-school status and they cannot be consolidated while they're in that in-school status. On the other hand, you have graduate plus loans, higher interest rates, higher origination fees, and they're also the only um, plus loans of the only type of federal student loans that require a credit check in order to obtain them. With graduate plus loans though, Technically, they don't have a grace period and they don't have mandatory in-school status. You could enter repayment on a grad plus loan immediately. And because of the fact that these grad plus loans do not have an in-school status, that means that they could be consolidated while a person is in school. So in this situation, we don't know what types of loans the borrower has taken out for graduate school. Um, I would assume that if they had eligibility left over for direct unsubsidized loans, that they probably took those because they're the more attractive loans. But to this borrower, if you took graduate plus loans, you could consolidate the graduate plus loans with your undergraduate loans. And if you completed the application by June 30th and the application is successful, then your graduate plus loans would be able to get the 80 qualifying payments that your um, undergraduate loans currently have. However, if your loans are direct unsubsidized loans, they have that in-school status attached to them and you would not be able to successfully consolidate them and bring them up to the place of having 80 qualifying payments just like your undergraduate loans do. So for those of you who are in a similar situation where you might not be enrolled in school right now, but you have loans that were borrowed with gaps in between, um, this IDR adjustment could help you bring all of these loans onto the same timeline. And that timeline is based on the history of uh, the loan in your portfolio that has the most repayment history. So and for most people, it's the oldest loan that you have. You could speed up your newer loans to match that pace. So if you do have loans that were borrowed years apart, um, you might want to look into consolidating through studentaid.gov only and making sure that you complete that application to consolidate by June 30th so that you can get the greatest amount of credit toward cancellation, whether it's through income driven repayment or public service loan forgiveness. Um, for this person, you have options. You can, if they're grad plus loans, you can consolidate them now. If they're not grad plus loans, you can still consolidate later, but the formula is going to change. Um, after or after June 30, if they're shifting to a weighted average model. So for people who have these loans with differing amounts of repayment history, you can consolidate those loans and then your payment count will be based on a weighted average. And that weighted average is going to be calculating using, going to be calculated using the balance of the individual loans and the qualifying payment count of those individual loans. So um, this is a situation where you really have to think about whether you want to have loans on two timelines or one. Um, if you keep them on two timelines, then the undergraduate loans will have 80 uh, qualifying payments right now. The loans from graduate school would have zero. They would have another at least 120 months once repayment starts to go until they would be eligible for forgiveness. Um, if you were to go with the weighted average, then your payment count would be somewhere between zero and 80 at the point that you consolidated or um, whatever your qualifying payment count is for the undergraduate loans at the point of consolidation, that would be factored into the weighted average figure. So somewhere between zero and that figure would be your qualifying payment count for all of the loans. But um, the point I really want to drive home here is one, that the benefits depend on your loan types. And there are lots of differences between direct sub and unsubsidized loans and graduate plus loans. But two, in terms of consolidating for PSLF or IDR, you do have options. The most attractive option is set to go away after June 30th, but you still have options after that date. So, so don't feel like you have to do something right this moment 
or you're not going to be able to get PSLF or IDR cancellation at all. You just will have a different formula if consolidation doesn't happen for you until after July 1st. All right. At this time, we can move on to the next question. All right. This question, uh, we're shifting gears out of PSLF and taking a look at um, the FAFSA. This question is, my parents live outside of the United States and it lets me add a different country in there, but not a state. How should I proceed when my parents live in another country? All right, let's take a look at the answer for this. When you're entering your parents' address into the FAFSA and they live outside of the US, you should select foreign country. This is in the state drop-down menu. Um, when the country is set to a non-US country, the state field should allow you to select foreign country instead of a state within the US. Um, we know that a lot of people are dealing with FAFSA issues right now, so I appreciate the person for asking this question because sometimes people um, feel like their question is, it's too easy, they should know it. But just keep in mind that um, the FAFSA um, asks a lot of you. <laughs> and sometimes, um, not just with the FAFSA, but with many applications, they're very US centered. So the United States might be the first option that you see or all the states before you see anything outside of the US. So just know that if your parents live outside of the US, yes, they can still, um, you know, you can still select that and indicate it. You just might have to look a little bit further than the surface. Um, as a general recommendation with the FAFSA, if you encounter issues or the option is not appearing for you collect correctly, you can contact federal student aid. You can reach them by email, phone, or the live chat. I believe the chat's name is Aiden if you go to studentaid.gov. So please do uh, reach out if you have those questions so that you can move forward with the FAFSA because the FAFSA is the gateway to all forms of federal financial aid, much of state aid, as well as private grants and scholarships. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, this is also a FAFSA question. Uh, this question has to do with the SAI. It says, my SAI score is negative 1500. Will I get the maximum Pell Grant or how will that work? All right, so the SAI, let's take a look at the answer for this one. The SAI is something that's a bit new. Many of us are used to dealing with something called the EFC, which was the expected family contribution. And that was a dollar amount that let you know how much your family was expected to contribute toward your higher education costs. The SAI, SAI is different. The SAI is not a dollar indicator of what your family is expected um, to contribute. However, there is a relationship between the SAI and a student's financial need. That um, relationship is an inverse one. So the lower the SAI, the higher the student's financial need. So in this case, the person has indicated that they have an SAI of negative 1500. And according to the Department of Education, this is the lowest uh, SAI in the range. So someone who has an SAI um, that low would qualify for the maximum Pell Grant. And right now that award is set at $7,395. That's for uh, the 24-25 academic year. Quick note here though, this assumes that the student has not exhausted their lifetime amounts for Pell and that they've also met all student eligibility requirements. So um, just thinking about the FAFSA, I really want um, people to just recognize the difference between the EFC and the SAI because it's very easy to look at this figure and think, you know, well, I have an SAI of say 5,000. Does that mean that my family is supposed to put up $5,000? This is a different system. It's a different calculation. It's a score, not a dollar value. So let's get used to the SAI. Know that the lower the SAI, the greater the student's financial need. And if you have any issues with the FAFSA, um, once you're in school, make sure that you reach out to your uh, financial aid office on your campus because they will be able to provide you with direct assistance if you have questions about your eligibility, lifetime amounts, um, disbursement. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you are in touch with your campus-based financial aid administrators. All right, let's move on to the next question. 
That question is, do I need to contact remaining colleges out of the ones that I wish to not attend once I've been accepted into one that I like? Will I get fined? This is a great question. Um, I just want to reassure you there are no fines. So if you have decided to go to one school and you haven't let the other three or so that you applied to know that you are not planning to attend, there is no fine. Um, it would be good um, to notify the schools if you are declining their offer of admission though. Um, that should help you stop receiving mailers um, and queries. Um, just to close the loop, you should make sure that you officially decline the offer. But just rest assured that if you don't make that contact, you don't have to be afraid of a fine you know, coming about. Um, also with financial aid, I know that in the FAFSA, you indicate whatever schools you're interested in. And so you start to hear from those schools and you probably hear from other schools as well. But just know that when it comes to financial aid actually being processed and reaching you, the student, it's only gonna be dispersed to the school where you enrolled. So the system is able to tell you know, where you have enrolled or that you have enrolled somewhere. And when it's time for, for financial aid to be processed, the process is going to flow through that school. Um, the other schools that you've applied to are not going to be included at that point because you did not accept their offer of admission. So financial aid will move, but it's only going to move through the school that you have enrolled in. And um, quick point, I know this wasn't a question here, but sometimes incoming students think that financial aid is going to come directly to them. And that's not the case. Financial aid moves through the school. So the funds go to your school first. They're going to cover the items that are um, on your bill, such as tuition and fees or meal plan if you have one. They'll cover all of those expenses that are included in the bill. And then if there's anything left over, that money would come to you directly. But the school receives the funds first and then whatever's left over would come to you uh, by way of the school. All right, I think that does it for the questions. So I don't see any in the comments. So at this moment, I want to um, just make sure that everyone is aware of some of the resources that we have here in the state of Maryland. Uh, we have a student loan ombudsman's office and that office is located in the state's Department of Labor. The student loan ombudsman um, is a party that is there to help you if you're experiencing like persistent problems with your loan servicer that you have not been able to resolve with them directly, you can reach out to the student loan ombudsman to help or to initiate an investigation if it's deemed necessary. They can help with problems including failure by the servicer to communicate with the borrower, errors in crediting principal and interest payments, misapplied payments, inaccurate interest rate calculations, billing errors, loan consolidation and modification errors and or inappropriate collection activity or tactics. So there are plenty of issues that the student loan ombudsman's office can assist you with. Um, just wanna make sure that everyone knows that the best advice is to try and come to a resolution with your servicer first before you engage a third party. But if you find that you are getting nowhere, then you definitely wanna make sure that you're advocating uh, for yourself by engaging parties like the state student loan ombudsman, or perhaps the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or even the Office of Federal Student Aid's um, ombudsman. You can visit them online at studentaid.gov and um, make sure that the issue that you're having falls under um, their purview. But the point is here, you've got options for support. You are not alone. And if you're experiencing these persistent issues, and um, resolution just doesn't seem like it's happening, please do escalate, involve these third parties that are there to help you um, arrive at a resolution. All right, uh, so I don't see any questions and we've reviewed the resources at this point. I would just like to say thank you so much for joining us for this, the June 26, 2024 edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. We are online at mccfw.org. And if you would like to stay connected with us via social media, we are at the MCCFW on Instagram, X, which is the site formerly known as Twitter, 
uh, as well as Facebook. We are at the MCCFW. We also have a growing library of videos on YouTube. We are at the MCCFW and soon this broadcast will join that library and um, the episode will be annotated so you can go straight to the content that um, concerns you most. And again, that'll be available on YouTube and we are at the MCCFW. All right, I am going to check the comments one last time to see if we have anything that's coming from our community, anything new. And I don't see anything at the moment. Um, I do want to make sure that you all know that you can reach out to us um, via mccfw.org and go to contact. We have a contact page where you can submit any questions or feedback um, that you might have. Um, again, we have the symposium coming up July 23rd of this year starts at 9 a.m. It's virtual, it's free, it's open to all. This is especially um, meant to reach our campus-based professionals and community partners who are dedicated to the work of advancing collegiate financial wellness in the state of Maryland and beyond. So if you're interested in attending the symposium, you can visit us online at mccfw.org and go to symposium. You'll be able to see archives from uh, prior events as well as the full agenda for this year's symposium and the link to register. I'm gonna check more time to see if I have any questions that have come in. And I don't see any at the moment. Uh, I think I think we're good on questions. I don't see any questions coming in on Facebook and I don't see any um, thing directed to me personally. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this edition of Office Hours, which is presented as a public service by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. If you have any questions that come up between now and the next edition, please do reach out to us again at mccfw.org. You can go through the contact page or you can also tag us on social media. We are at the MCCFW. And uh, check one more time. We're clear. So until next time, be well. And for those of you all that are traveling for the Independence Day holiday, I'm wishing you an enjoyable time and safe travels. So until next time, be well.